This is a Pastor Appreciation Month, and I had uh, some thoughtful uh, ex-friends of the class that uh, were in Georgia, and I can't imagine anybody being stressed in Georgia, but uh, they uh, uh, thought of me when they saw this hat for us the last few weeks. We've been on uh, uh, stress and burnout, and uh, from a distance, all you see is too stressed. From a distance, you get up close too blessed to be stressed. Oh, is what it says. Oh, it says. Too blessed to be stressed. So, uh, Mark, Tracy, oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to bury you, but uh, uh, thank, thank you for uh, taking of me while, while you were away. Listen, on, on your tables are some little journey cards. Honestly, I don't remember Colleen mentioned those. Uh, this week, just this week and next week, I'll probably do it a couple times a year. Probably, when you go to worship at either 8.30 or at 11.30, you probably sit in the same general area every week. That would probably be true since we're all creatures of habit. My guess is, especially in Franklin and Glenn service, there are people all around you, you may not know their name, but you know their faces because they're there like you are. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Ask, introduce yourself to them and ask them, are you going to like them? If they say yes, good. Good. If they say, no, I'm not, invite them to ours. Just invite them to ours. Okay? Hand them a card. There's the information. And we're going to do that for a couple weeks and then, you know, shut down, maybe come back uh, six months or so and do it again. But I'll have tables just take a couple and we'll have some more on there next week. But that's what they're there for. It's just as an you know, invitation tool uh, to the folks that sit around you in worship. Now, you can give them anybody, I guess, but, but especially those that are around you in worship. That way, once you ask them, are you in a drive group, they say no and you invite them and they don't show up. And every time they see you, they feel guilty. Okay? <laughs> Okay, and gift is a wonderful thing, okay? Uh, so it may drive them here, but it may not drive them to stay here. But, uh, uh, but help us with that in the next uh, couple of weeks. And then the next slide is just a reminder, trying to establish, and you guys have just done a great job uh, on the Facebook presence, the page, especially the group, up to 75 to 80 in the public uh, group, and really, really appreciate your response to that. If you've not done that, please join us. Uh, there is kind of how I get out videos and different messaging uh, to you, especially during uh, uh, during the week. Okay, we're in a series. Problems, problems, problems. Now I don't know if this is true in your life, but maybe the fact that I'm teaching, I never would have dreamed, but I should have expected. I want to do a series on problems. Okay, everything's falling apart. <laughs> What is the deal? You know, you know everything's just you know, going, uh, going crazy. Uh, but uh, uh, one of those is I shared with you, Linda is uh, hopefully returning tomorrow night and visiting her sister who uh, has a terminal cancer in uh, Kentucky, trying to visit her mom who's also there who just turned 103. And uh, the visit with her and trying to you know, uh, navigate both of those. And... Uh, uh, but, uh, hospice came in day before yesterday. So, you know, it could be a quick trip back and back. We don't, we don't know yet, but many of you have been there. Just keep praying for, uh, for her and strength and for her sister Margaret Lane and for, uh, for the family. I know that we would appreciate it very, uh, very uh, much. Okay? Now, today, take your, uh, take your listing guide and we're looking at the uh, subject of, of disappointment. Disappointment. We all face it, and it hurts. It hurts. Sometimes it comes from events or circumstances. It could be uh, uh, your uh, your spouse this, uh, uh, you know, gets into an affair or gets into an emotional affair, or what have you, and you're disappointed in the circumstances that take place there. Uh, uh, a lot of times when I buy things, I buy things hopefully to make my life easier. I can't tell you how many times I've been disappointed in that lack of outcome. I thought this was going to really uh, just make things even worse, uh, perhaps, uh, in life. 
Uh, but you know, event circumstances, the pains, they disappoint us, but we'll have to admit that probably the greatest disappointments in life have been people. People uh, that uh, uh, I, I'm a very responsible person. And one of my pet peeves is people being irresponsible. And I get disappointed uh, quickly, too quickly probably, uh, with uh, folks who don't uh, follow through with what they say that they would do. Uh, it's probably the most devastating disappointment with persons, and I know some of you are like me in this sense, you're a perfectionist. So as disappointed as I might get in other people in my life, Day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, a year in and out, the person that disappoints me the most is me. Nobody is harder on me than me. Nobody. Okay? Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I, you know, I, I preach in the big room. Honestly, I don't know. I, I probably spend somewhere 20 to 30 hours in preparation for those, uh, prayer time and preparation. And I don't know that I ever walked out of this room or off the platform that I'm not already beating myself up in disappointment. Of, you could have done better. You could have been more prepared. You could have done better. Now that's the perfectionism that's in me that uh, that, that I grapple with. But some of you uh, would understand that. So we had disappointment and events and circumstances and things and people ourselves, but we also get disappointed in God. When we don't feel like God did what we expected Him to do, what we thought made perfect sense to us, and He didn't move, He didn't do what we wanted uh, Him to do. And I was thinking this week, and I said a little bit on the video that I sent out earlier in the week. Uh, go to the next slide, Mark. Uh, uh, I'm going to come back to the text in just a minute. Go on, I think, two slides ahead. There we go. What causes, I, I thought about this, pretty, why do I get disappointed? Why do we get disappointed at things, events, circumstances, and people? Why? And I couldn't come up with anything but this. Unmet expectations. We, we just didn't get what we expected. What we wanted. Now, next week is disappointment really two levels down. When you're disappointed, the next thing is you get frustrated. That's kind of a ratchet it up one level. Then if that's not managed, what we talk about next week is anger. Anger. But all of that stems from unmet expectations. What? Why do we feel that way? Look at the next slide. I hate to say that. Because <laughs> it forces all of us to look in the mirror. Because we all get disappointed. We all get disappointed in events, things, situations, people, self, and perhaps God. And the reason we do is we didn't get our way. There are two personal pronouns in that sentence. We didn't get our way. We and I. We would never be disappointed if we weren't self-centered and didn't have expectations. Right? I don't know where the balance is in having expectations, especially of people. And they don't live up to those. I don't, I don't know where that balance is. I'm just being very honest with you. I don't know where it lies. I think it's okay to have realistic expectations of loved ones, friends, co-workers. But is it okay when they don't live up to those expectations for me to be disappointed because I didn't get my way? You, you see the tension that we have to live with? Today we're going to look at a, an experience I really prayed and uh, and, and this thought of all of the events, circumstances, people, disappointments that are in Scripture. Because there were a lot of disappointed people in the Bible. So I guess we're a good company. 
where would I go? So I ended up with with uh, with Moses and the, uh, and the and the children of Israel. If any leader ever had a challenge, it was Moses. Leading 600,000 men, Jewish men, and then their families, and all of their animals from Egypt toward the Promised Land. That's not an easy assignment at all. So, Go back, what Mark, if you would, to the text. And let me read through. Find Exodus 15 and find verse 22. And we're going to look at these uh, six verses as we examine uh, uh, what disappointment looks like. Okay? Exodus 15, verse 22. <clears throat> then Moses led Israel, this Israelites, again, two to three million people, from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Can you imagine trying to find water for two to three million people in a desert? When they came to Barak, they could not drink this water because it was bitter. It's bad enough to be thirsty. It may be worse to have water you can't drink. That ratchets it up just even a little bit more. That's why it's called rock. <clears throat> so the people praised Moses for his leadership. <laughs> That's not what he said. Okay. Really? Can you imagine? So uh, the people grumbled. You know why you grumble? I think you do. You know why we complain? There's only one reason to grumble and one reason to blame. The same one is we're disappointed. We didn't get what we expected. There's a missing beatitude. There are two of them, frankly. Matthew 5, there are eight or nine beatitudes. Blessed are. There's a missing beatitude in Acts 20. Uh, it's more blessed to give than receive. And there's a, another one in Matthew 11, 6 where Jesus says, blessed is the man, is the person who will take no offense in me. Translated means this. You are blessed, you are at peace, you are satisfied, and you are fulfilled when you will let me run your life. When that doesn't happen, we run. Now, we haven't gotten there yet, but if we were to slip over to Numbers and slip over to uh, uh, New Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, looking back on Numbers, God killed, that's hard to say in the same sentence, isn't it? God killed, I think, 25,000 Israelites. Anybody remember for what? Grumbling. I don't know why I'm not dead a hundred times over. <laughs> and you with me? And then? And then? Okay. So they're running. They're running against Muslims, but they're really upset, I think, with God. And they say to him, What are we going to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood, a tree. He threw it in the water, and the water became thick or sweet, is the idea, to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all of His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on uh, the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Remember, He had just led them uh, out of Egyptian bondage as a result of the number of plagues on the Egyptian people. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. 
So a lot of disappointment going on here from the uh, from the from the Jewish nation, from the people, uh, uh, from uh, from Moses. Just a lot going on here. What can we learn about managing and dealing with the disappointments uh, in our life? And I've got three. Uh, I've got just kind of three suggestions that I draw from the story. So let's just kind of look at those. Take your listening guide and let's just kind of walk through those and see what they have to teach us. Number one, Mark, go to the first uh, point. I don't remember what it was. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. There you go. Life's greatest highs, and we have them, are often followed by deep lows. Life's greatest highs are often followed by deep lows. Is that true? Of course it is. Often. I wouldn't say every time, but it's close. Go back uh, to verse 22. The f What's the first word in verse 22? Then. So something has happened sequentially. Then. Go back with me to in your Bibles, go back to uh, chapter 12, but give it a little bit of historical, geographical context because to, to add impact to the then. When is the then? If you look at verse 37, 12, 37, this is when the Exodus, when Pharaoh, at least temporarily, gave permission for Moses to lead uh, the, the Hebrew nation out of bondage and toward the Promised Land. It, God has sent a number of miraculous plagues of a variety of uh, 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 kinds in order to get Pharaoh's attention to release uh, the enslaved people of God. So the Exodus begins with 600,000 men on foot, as it says. And then if you follow it along in chapter 12 and 13, you see the, uh, uh, the, the Passover uh, uh, instituted. In chapter 13 is largely a speech from Moses of God's favor and God's uh, guidance and God's hand on them. God would guide them by the cloud by day, the fire by night. God had miraculously delivered them through the plagues, miraculously uh, released by Pharaoh, miraculously uh, 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 guided them at night and day so they'd be headed in the right direction. Then you come to chapter 14, and we know the story of uh, crossing the Red Sea. Uh, Pharaoh changes his mind, sends the Egyptian soldiers, uh, you know, after uh, the, uh, the, the two to three million Jewish people, uh, got to believe, were traveling very slowly. Two to three million boats with animals. And, and children, and, uh, and miraculously, uh, God opens the sea. All of us have seen crossing Heston with the hair going back, and uh, parting the waters, and uh, and then walking across, marching across, and then God closing it as the Egyptian army gets there, and the horse and the rider Egyptian is thrown into the sea. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable. You're talking about, you're talking about God. You're talking about high. You're talking about blessing. Talk about an unbelievable experience of the hand and movement of God in the lives of the Jewish people and the lives of their leader Moses. So in chapter 15, Moses uh, writes a song. It's a song praising God for His mighty hand, power, and deliverance, and guidance. And he writes this song, and then the uh, 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 and then in verses 19 and 20, uh, 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 Miriam, his sister. Just kind of adds to the song. And then uh, verse 21 says, And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and rider, the horse and his rider, he has thrown into the sea then. Do you get then? After all this has happened, after all the ups, after all the highs, after all the victories, then. Then, look at verse 22. Then, they set out from the Red Sea. Remember again, what has just happened? And they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days. Not three weeks, not three months, not three years. Three days. Three days. In the wilderness, and they found no water. I'm, uh, I'm amused by uh, how many water problems the Jewish people had. 
I mean, first they had the Red Sea. That's too much water. <laughs> right? And now they got Moab. Some people are never at. <laughs> well, we know. When they came to Rob, they could not drink the water of Rob because it was bitter. Now they got water, but they can't drink it. I mean, they got water problems. All sorts of, of, of issues. And again, it's not a small problem to try to uh, uh, give water to two to three million, uh, uh, two to three million people. Only three days <clears throat> after the miraculous, you know, how far back the then goes, I don't know, but at least to the miraculous deliverance from the Red Sea, at least that far back. Maybe even further. Three days later, three, only three days later, they're at the bottom. Look at the next slide. That's true. It may not be as low as the mountain was high. Those things all vary. But we can expect that after their victories and successes and, and things are well, we can expect that Things are probably not going to stay that way. The reason this is important, if you understand this principle, you'll be less disappointed. You will be. Because you kind of anticipated that it might come after you've experienced a high, especially, uh, as it were, a, 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 a spiritual high. And how did the people respond, respond again? Verse 44. The people grumbled against Moses. They grumbled against his leadership. What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord. The Lord showed him a tree. The response of the people was, why did you lead us into this valley of disappointment? Moses, it's all your fault. It's all your fault. And then notice, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Look at verse 25 then. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there he what? Test it in. Is it possible that every disappointment is a test? Is that possible? Every disappointment is a test. You see at the Red Sea, and maybe even prior to that, in the, in the, in the journey of the, of the Jewish nation from Egyptian slavery, God's character was tested over and over. Will He be faithful? Will He do as He promised? Will He follow her? Will He lead us? Will He guide us? Will He miraculously deliver us from certain death from the Egyptians? Will He? So you could really look back and say up to the then, God's character had been tested and now their character is tested. Every time you and I face a disappointment, there's a test in it. And it's really testing the metal of our character. Of how much we really, really trust God. Because again, there's no way to be disappointed if we didn't have expectations. So the expectations have got to be kept as it were realistic. If you have them, uh, uh, have them at all. And there, he tested them. Let me ask you, what is your, and I'll, then I'll move on, ask you to think about what the biggest disappointment is in your life, at least to this point. A larger one could be awaiting. But looking back over the trail of disappointments that we all face, some are bigger than others, of course. What would you say is your general response to the disappointments of life? That's a test of your character. Whatever, whatever, whatever your response was. Because every disappointment is a response. And I think God tested them. I think He tested them in terms of, you might say, are their eyes going to be on, on the circumstances, the events, the things, or are they going to be on Him? I think it was a test for their faithfulness. 
Would they stay true and follow and obey and do what he told them to do? And the rest of the journey tells us for the most part, no. For the most part, no. And I, my guess is, that's not true. I know some lives are tougher than others, and I don't have an explanation for that. But I think for most of us, though, there may have been some, some disappointments of, of a huge proportion in lives. I think if most of us uh, sat down and took a sheet of paper and drew a line down the middle on the left side, we put down the blessings and the highs uh, of life, and on the right hand side, we put down the disappointments of life. I'm betting for most of us, the left side wins. Doesn't mean there's not a right side. There is. Welcome to humanness and sinfulness in a fallen world. But keeping it in perspective that life's highs are often followed, if not always followed, by disappointing lows. Helps manage disappointment. Here's a second principle. Look at the next uh, uh, slide, Mark. Why? Well, I'm sorry. Contest us. Uh, here we go. Here's a second kind of principle on this point. Life's greatest services, what we do with our lives, are often followed by forgetfulness. Are often followed by forgetfulness. How many days had it been? Isn't it amazing how soon we forget? I have a, I have a wonderfully powerful remembrance Especially a disappointment. I would literally need to sit down and begin to visibly write out because the first thing that would come to my mind is that I have been more disappointed than blessed. And I know that's not true if I sat down and began to make a list of it. But the first response would be, why? Because we forget. We forget. You think the Jewish people forgot how God had used Moses? To help deliver them through the through his rod, as it were, and through the plagues that uh, that God brought through Moses on the uh, on the uh, on the Egyptian people, and they marched three million of them <coughs> through the desert uh, with the guidance of a cloud and guidance of fire, and then this sea is miraculously opened and they walk across as on dry land, and then God closes it on the people, and three days later they forgot God and they forgot how great Moses' leadership had been in their lives. Isn't that the way it is? Isn't that the way it is? One of the things, and, and, and I think, I used to think it may be more age-driven, but having kids and then grandkids, I don't know, I don't know that it's age-driven. I think it's sin-driven. And that's this. We easily take people for granted. I don't think we do that intentionally. We try to teach our children when they're young. Say thank you. Don't we? Say thank you. Thank you. Say thank you. And they do, but have you ever wondered that they mean it? Because we basically commanded them to do it. I wonder if we as adults are much better. It's easy to take situations, circumstances, people, family, co-workers, friends, God, for granted. For granted. That will always lead to disappointment. It will always lead to disappointment. Have you noticed that it's hard to be disappointed when you're grateful? Those are not, they don't share a bed together. But it's easier for some of us, and I would raise my hand, to be disappointed than just be grateful. Because we forget. It's, 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 it's natural, it's human, cynical maybe, to forget the role that, that, that people have played in our lives. One of the things that I, that I have tried to learn to do in, in, in recent years 
is, uh, you know, when I'm with people or talking to people, or, and usually it's guys and what have you, and, and, uh, and we talk about their life and how people have influenced their life and the heroes in their life, you know, could be parents, grandparents, teachers, coaches, friends, who bosses, who knows? I've learned to always ask this question. When was the last time you said thank you? When was the last time that you reached out to a high school coach or you reached out to a high school or a college teacher or a boss 25 years ago? They won't always be living, neither will you. Just simply to say, I have forgotten. Thanks. Thanks. That's a great uh, exercise for all of us to make a pattern of gratefulness and thankfulness and not forgetfulness for those men and women, family, not family, friends, who have invested in our lives to remember to say thanks. Remember to say thanks. Uh, you know, it's easy for kids. All of, my, all of my children are adults. But it's easy for, for them to forget. I've got grandkids. But it's easy for them to forget. I'm just admonishing you and me that one of the reasons we get disappointed is because we forget and we take people for granted and we take even our circumstances for granted. I don't know what's going on in your journey and I made light of some things that are going on in our household uh, in these days, but I do know this. I can probably find people in this very room whose circumstances and events and life situations are a whole lot worse than mine. A whole lot worse. We need to be great. And my guess is, if the worst scenario in the room, as horrific as it may be, I'll bet you we can go to the big room and find ten more stories worse than yours. So, let's be grateful and let's not be forgetful. So, how do you manage the disappointment? This is where I kind of work in. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these. So what do you do then when you're disappointed? Look at your, look at your outline. I've got two things you don't do and two things that you do. Okay, here's number one. Uh, Margo, that, uh, that, uh, that number one <laughs> is don't curse it. Don't get mad at it. Don't get angry at it. Uh, 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 don't retaliate, especially if it's a person. Now, years ago, when I had anger issues, we'll talk about that more next week, especially when it was things and they didn't live up to my expectations, I broke them. Okay? It, was just, it made me feel better. It didn't help. Over the long haul, I usually either had to replace it or figure out another way to solve it. So it just doesn't do any good to curse it. You know, if, if I'm the leader and I'm Moses and I'm not Moses and I was the leader, after what had happened with the Jewish people, after what God had done looking back all the way through the Red Sea, when they came to Him and they complained to Him, what are we to drink? My human response would have been if I could have had a megaphone to all those folks, I'd gone to the nearest mountain and say, forget you! I'm out of here! Forget you! I'm out of here! I'm gone. So don't retaliate. Don't get defensive. Don't attack back. Here's a principle. I put it in my notes, but I, I didn't put it up here. It's, and I don't know if you agree with this is true, but at least let me say this. When we stop, when we start retaliating, God stops defending. When we start retaliating, getting back, getting even, because we've been disappointed, God stops defending us. Mm -hmm. So don't curse it. Let, let God say it. Number two, don't nurse it. Don't feed it. Don't have a pity party. Don't, don't replay it over and over and over again in your mind. Have you noticed that when, when you do that, how big it gets. It just grows. The more you nurse it in your mind and in your heart, it'll get bigger and bigger. So don't curse it. Don't nurse it. What do you do? Number three. Do, I call it dispersing. Get it out. And I'd say get it out to God. Get it, he can handle it. 
Moses cried to the Lord. Moses cried to the Lord. He could have fussed at the people. But he cried to the Lord. He went to God with his disappointment. Maybe in God and in the people. Don't hang on to it. When, when we're disappointed, let's not gossip with it. Let's not throw somebody who disappointed us under the bus. Let's just keep it to ourselves most of the time and talk to God about it. I think it will have less damage on relationships. And then in an interesting, God showed him a what? A tree. You know, there are only two trees specifically really mentioned in Scripture. One was in Genesis. And this one. What do you think? What do you think this tree might refer to? Cross. Talk about Jesus being hanged on the tree. Where do we find hope and encouragement to go on? Now, what I find interesting, sometimes they have a tendency to make a lot and maybe nothing is, it says in verse 25, and he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a, a wood or a tree. If he showed it to them, then was it there all along? It was there all along. He just missed it. Hello? There all along, we just miss it. But we want to hang on to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the disappointment. And then number four, do second do do let God uh, reverse it. Remember when Joseph was sold into slavery by his own family, and he ended up in in the same Egypt, and eventually became second in command and in charge of just about everything from for the Pharaoh. And a great famine uh, uh, in the uh, land of Israel, and, they, and his family has to come go to Egypt to get food, and they find themselves before their very own brother that they had sold into slavery. Remember Joseph's response to that sequence of events that were certainly not good in his life. Genesis fifty twenty. What you meant for evil. God meant for good. Wouldn't it be a great thing to remember? That God has the power. All things work together for good. What does all include? All. Uh, might that include disappointment? All. All things God uses. God is able. God is able. So God had a solution. The solution was in the tree, through the tree, into the bitter water, and it became sweet. Taking things to the cross as a way of changing things. And then number three is really a reminder and a reversal of number one, but that's purely intentional on my part. Look at number three. Life's greatest disappointments are often followed by greater blessings. I mean, the first was true. first was true is that life great highs are often followed by deep love. That's true. But I wanted to close on the upside, and that's this. Life's greatest disappointments are often followed by greater blessings. Notice what happened. Verse 27. Then they came to Elam. Then they came to Elam. And they found 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And they encamped there by the water. They found palm springs. <laughs> You're in the desert, okay? You're in the desert, okay? And, and, and God makes water sweet in Marah uh, uh, through the cross, as it were, and the tree thrown into the bitter. How far is it from Marah to Elam? I want to 
close with this thought about walking through disappointment. We can choose to live in the rock. Life's not much fun and we aren't either. Or we can choose to keep going. To keep going and make our way to Eden where there's an oasis. Where there's Palm Springs. And they stayed there for about a month. I don't blame them, do you? I think the whole point of the story when we face disappointment is, and I think it's very simple. I don't know that it's even profound. Is don't quit and build a tent in the rock. Keep moving. It's not near as far as a journey as we tend to think. Keep moving. So, you can choose today to live in the rock and, uh, and uh, it not only tastes bitter, the water stinks. Or you can choose to keep moving. Give it to God. Keep going. Okay. And that's a choice that I think we have to make every any, many times a day, especially when we face uh, disappointments. Look at the last, uh, the next slide. Lesser self-centeredness equals lesser expectations equals fewer disappointments. I don't know if it's realistic to have no expectations. But if they were less about what I wanted, less self-centeredness, then less expectations, probably more realistic, and then I would be with fewer disappointments. I remember uh, uh, Brother Jim, years ago, one of those things that, one of those phrases or things that, 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 that has always stuck in my mind. And that was this. Life's disappointments are God's appointments. Life's disappointments are God's appointments. Okay? All right. Uh, next slide, Mark, if you would please. Uh, we're going to take uh, disappointment to frustration and anger. Uh, uh, those are the passages I'd like you to read uh, several times for next week, Ephesians 4, 26, 27, and 31, and then Matthew 5, 21 to 24, okay? Let me have a word of prayer, then there are a couple of questions that I want you to wrestle with at your table. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for Moses and the experience of the Jewish people, and thank you that all through this book, your book, our disappointments with you, with self, with others, with events and circumstances. I guess that's part of the ebb and flow of life in a fallen world. And yet, you have such great, awesome power and you love us so much and want us to, to grow to be like you so much that every one of life's disappointments, small or great, is an opportunity to meet with you. Help us to step into that and take that short trip from the bitter waters of Marah to the palm springs of Eden. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.